If you wanna use backing tracks with your band, you must use Ableton Live. And if you wanna use Ableton Live the way the pros do, then you need to build one Ableton Live session with all of your songs. In today's tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to do that in a way that's efficient, flexible, and stable. So yes, there are multiple ways to use Ableton Live on stage. There's multiple ways to make different things happen in live. But when it comes to using backing tracks, there is, uh, I've found, yes, multiple ways to do it, but there's one way to do it the way the pros do, a way that gives you flexibility and freedom to jump around in your song, a way that uh, keeps your Ableton session stable and running without issues, and most importantly to me, a way that's efficient. Uh, I've shown before on this channel how I can build an Ableton Live set of multiple songs in less than five minutes, and that all comes down to following a proven process. The proven process I'm gonna teach you today is the third part of what I call the three-part framework for using tracks and it all comes down to this using a template you can get the exact template that I show in this video in this tutorial by heading to from studio to stage.com slash template it's completely free and when you download the template available for PC and Mac live 9 and higher intro standard and suite uh, you're gonna be able to follow along the process in this tutorial um, now I, before this video, uh, I have formatted the songs that I'm gonna use for this particular set. And in fact, in a previous tutorial, um, I showed you the things I add to my songs to format them. I've linked that below in the description of this video so you can catch up. So here's four songs that uh, I have taken and I have applied part two of the three-part framework for using tracks to format uh, this template. So part one uh, of the three-part framework is to have a template for live performance. Again, that's what I have right here uh, by using this Ableton Live free tracks template, which again, you can get by heading to from studiostage.com slash template. Part two is that I went and took that template and formatted these Ableton Live songs exactly the same way. No matter what type of content you have, I'm formatting them exactly the same way. Then part three is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna take uh, about 10 to 15 minutes. I'm gonna walk you through how I'm gonna take these songs and build an Ableton Live set. If you're ready for it, let's dive in and get going. Okay, so first thing I've done is I've added this folder on my desktop to um, my live browser over here. And we've talked about how to do that before, uh, clicking add folder, choosing it, adding it to your browser. And I'm just gonna start building my Ableton Live session. First thing you may notice, I am in arrangement view. Uh, I just did a tutorial shooting out session in arrangement view. I've talked until I'm blue in the face about why you should use arrangement view for running tracks. But uh, watch those videos if you don't believe me. And if you still don't believe me, just trust me and go with it, follow this process, and then you'll be a, be a believer once you're done with it. So let's start with this first song here. These are a couple songs I used from a Christmas um, uh, performance a couple months ago as I'm recording this. Uh, and I'm gonna start building my set. So the first thing I'm gonna do is click the arrow to the left of this live project folder. And I'm gonna drag the live set into this set. So I'm essentially taking my Ableton Live set and bringing it into another Ableton Live set. And the set that I'm dragging into is my template, the template that I downloaded from studiosage.com slash template. Okay, uh, so now let's close this up. We're just gonna do a little bit of work here to clean this up. I'm gonna take the top bit here of this song. I'm gonna cut it and I'm gonna go press one and paste it right up here, right? And then I'm gonna delete these extra tracks that I have. Uh, now we're gonna press two to go to locator two and I'm gonna move this. I'm gonna put this right on uh, the next downbeat of, uh, of uh, one here. So this is measure 117. Let's go for our next song. So I'm gonna go to this song, Diddly Squat, funny name, great song. We're gonna drop this into our Ableton Live session. Again, we'll close this up. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do. You'll notice that song two dropped right below song one. That is okay. I'm not stressed about that. It's not gonna take me tons of time. I'm gonna highlight everything to the left. I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna press two, which has been pre-mapped to my locator thanks to that template, and I'm gonna paste it. And you may be going, whoa, 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 you're, you're going way too fast. It's, it's hard for me to follow. Well, all I'm doing is I'm just following the steps that I teach uh, as a part of the three-part framework for using tracks. Again, please go from cdsage.com slash template to download this template for free. But when you do that, you also get ac access to my six-day free course where I show you exactly how to format your songs and exactly how to build your Ableton Live set. So I'm just doing the steps that I teach in that free course that's very, very easy for anyone to follow, no matter what your skill level is, right? So now we've got these songs. Here's what I do. I press shift and I click right above, uh, above um, the, uh, the formatted stems that I have here and I cut these, right? So I cut the top part of this. I click up here, press two, and then I paste, okay? And so now we're gonna delete these songs here. 
Uh, what's great about this process is this process works no matter if my song has tempo changes, time signature changes, uh, it does not matter. Um, this, this all works perfectly fine. Let's do our third song here, Hark the Herald, which is a really cool arrangement of this song. Uh, kind of funky Stevie Wonder-esque version of this song, which is cool. Now I'm gonna cut this, I'm gonna press three, I'm gonna paste. You can see I'm doing the same exact process uh, for every single one of my songs. Again, it doesn't matter the tempo, the time signature, uh, doing the same exact process, okay? So we pasted that in, we'll delete these songs. Another thing that's really interesting, I, I do wanna pause just for a second to point this out. One of the mistakes I see people make um, uh, when they go to use tracks on stage is they will create a track and say guitars and every single one of their guitar stems goes into there. Um, typically, you probably have multiple guitar stems, so they go guitar one, guitar two, guitar three. And when they go to build their Ableton Live set, they're going over to the browser. Maybe they've seen me go to the browser before, so they got that part, and they go to guitar, and they go, oh, there's guitar one, and they drag guitar one in. Oh, there's guitar two, they drag guitar two in. Uh, guitar three, they drag guitar three in. And they do that, which is one, gonna take way too long. If you build your set that way, that's gonna take way too long. And two, what do you do if each song has a different amount of stems in it? So for example, let's look at all the stems that I have here, Comfort and Joy. Uh, we've got uh, a decent amount of stems here, but let's look at guitars. So these are all our acoustic guitars. Um, looks like, as far as I could see, it looks like we actually don't have any electric guitars in this song, okay? So um, I, that would maybe throw off my process a little bit. Again, you could see here, we only have one guitar stem. Uh, if I go into this song, we have three guitar stems. In this method and following my process, it doesn't matter how many stems I have per song. It doesn't matter how many guitar parts I have because those are all grouped together. And you're going, but Will, I like separate outputs. Well, I do too. Uh, that's why I use return tracks here. And I've already routed each one of these tracks two separate return tracks which show up in my template and you can see those set up here for an eight output interface already routed, which is great. So now let's go to our last song uh, in this process. We're gonna press four. Again, what I love about this process, like I said, is it grows with you. Even if you're doing like a 15 song set, even if you're building a master set where you're gonna have every song in your session, uh, if you follow this process and format everything exactly the same way, it's gonna be really easy to make changes uh, and it's gonna be really easy to keep up with everything, okay? So we'll paste this, do the same thing. And again, no matter how many songs I have in my set, no matter what type of content it is, um, even, I'll say, even if it's like just um, a click in guide cues and it doesn't have stems, I'm gonna follow the same process, format exactly the same way and it's just gonna drop in just like that. So I would venture to say, I just build a set faster than most people build their Ableton Live sets, right? Just by doing that. And if I leave this alone just the way it is, um, for most of, us, most of us, this is probably fine, right? Let's just walk through a couple things we have here. I do a couple extra steps. We'll spend the last five minutes of this video talking about what those are. But let me show you what we have, right? And then we'll talk about what else we could do. So in this particular case, let's go to song one. So I press one on my keyboard. And actually let's delete this extra locator here. But I press one on my keyboard, that's gonna be song one. If I press two, there's song two, three, uh, song three, and then four, there's song four. Now, again, from there, if we had a, a large amount of songs, uh, we could use a set list management plugin to, to reorder songs if we wanted to. I, honestly, the easiest way to reorder songs in your Ableton Live set, if you don't have too many of them, is just change the mapping that you have. When you get my template, uh, it's pre-mapped for one through five on your keyboard. Um, but that's a real easy thing to change or, or throw in a set list management plugin if you're doing a large amount of content. But I have my four songs in my set. I can select those four songs. Uh, I could press play, so I could do three. Press play, that song is gonna play. Um, you're not able to hear it right now based on the way I have the set routed, but uh, that song is then gonna play. I could go in if I wanted and really edit my, um, my transitions here, um, or I could just leave it the way it is and literally start my set at the beginning and then let it flow. And it's just gonna be a hands-off set where I flow between songs, which is really nice. Now in my Tracks 301 course on the site, I teach how to really customize transitions, how to have Ableton Live stop after every song, how to have it stop and automatically select our next song, or even jump from maybe song two to song 16 in the set automatically. But even just, like I said, at this point, just looking at our set, this is enough to really use on stage. We've got our songs in there, they're mapped. Um, our transitions, are, are they just automatically flow? If we need to stop, we could, for example, get to the end of the song, just leave a little bit of space, press space bar three, space bar to start. 
Um, that's that's probably fine for most of what we're doing. Our audio routing's already done. Uh, as you can see, we're using sends for each one of our songs. If I unfolded these, we're using sends for each one of these songs. We're turning on and off parts as we need them. We're adjusting uh, volumes of each one of our parts as we need them. Uh, and then because we're using sends for each of our tracks, uh, then they are going out to our return tracks here. So we have separate outputs. Uh, and let's say just for example, as we're talking about outputs, let's go to our return tracks. If you look at our return tracks here, I'm set up for an eight output routing. Um, that's kind of standard typical thing that you would see live. But let's say I was in a scenario where um, we just needed uh, you know, two outputs, click and guide on the left, tracks on the right. Most people would have to do a lot of work to do that. Watch what I have to do if I'm in this particular setup. Okay, so I'm gonna do external out here. I'm gonna set this to two and we're done. All right, so I just took my entire set uh, I still have individual routing and I said, okay, let's make it two outputs, one and then two. And if I wanted to go back and get back to where we are, let's change this so that I can fake our routing real quick. If I wanted to get this back and go back to uh, stereo pairs, then I can go back here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, and I could do 910 if I wanted. However, I want to route that, I can route it that way. And notice I did not touch my individual songs, and that's the beauty of using sends and returns. Okay, so even if you're just at this point, I mean, this is going to work for you. But again, there's a couple other things I do. So to make the most of our time, let's jump back into this real quick and let me finish up what I do. So, first thing I do is I add locators throughout my set. Um, I teach you in tracks 301 how to have Ableton Live automatically add your locators back in. But honestly, I don't even use that process. It, it's cool, it's neat that you can do that, but this is what I do. So I go to my Ableton Live session, I go up here to set and I just pick something like let's pick L, right? That works for me. And then I click on my markers and I press L and that just adds a locator. And this is something that um, honestly you could just do while you're watching TV, right? Instead of Netflix and chill, it's Netflix and add locators. Um, and I'm just clicking through my song and just adding locators in. This takes for an entire set of songs takes about a minute long. Um, you could again, automate this, you could, um, you know, hire an intern to do it. You could hire someone on Fiverr to do it, whatever you want to do, but it really does not take uh, that long at all to do. And for me, it's worth it because of the flexibility I get to have access to, um, to every single song section um, in my set and to really quickly navigate that just using my previous and next locator buttons. Uh, that to me is what really adds a lot of the freedom and flexibility that I want and personally uh, need when I'm working with artists, no matter what type of music it is, I need that flexibility and freedom to be able to jump around um, in my arrangement really, really easily. Uh, okay, so last song here. And again, something I always hear from people, you'll see as I zoom out here, a lot of people will say, um, well, I don't know if we can do a range of view because we have a lot of songs and that's a lot of locators that would be added. Um, it, if it's overwhelming to you to have all these locators, uh, it's perfectly fine because you could see here, I mean, we still have uh, our markers track, so we don't necessarily have, uh, have to have locators, but I like having locators because I like having this previous and next button up here, again, where I can navigate my set uh, entirely just from my MIDI controller or doing key mapping. Um, which is really, really great. So now I have locators. The reason I add uh, locators to my session is to get access to each individual song and navigate it really easily using the previous and next locator button. So for example, I can start this song, let's get into the intro of this. Um, and let's say I wanted to repeat the intro. So we're officially in the intro, I wanted to repeat the intro. Anytime in that intro, I could hit previous locator button and jump back. Uh, I could also automate this with MIDI clips create what I call a repeat track uh, to enable that with my MIDI controller. And then I can also use previous locator button um, to jump around in my song. Uh, I have one bar here uh, due to global quantization. I have one measure to make changes. And a lot of times I hear from people that say, well, Will, how can I set it up to where I have access to every single song section? Um, that's possible. You could do that with Touch OSC. You could really do that with anything if you wanted. But previous and next locator has worked for me in almost every scenario I've been in. For some scenarios where I do really need access at any point to any section, I create a touch with a C template, but that's very, very rare. That's like twice in my entire career that I've needed to do that. I get all the access I need just from these buttons. Like, for example, let's get to the end of this song section here. Um, let's jump verse three, why not, right? And we jump to verse three. I, I've been able to, and um, I think I've showed this on a couple other videos, really quickly navigate uh, clicking previous uh, locator or next locator rather in this case, to jump to a completely different song section. I could still mini map, lots of possibilities there, but having locators is huge for me. Now, final piece of this, let's just zoom out, take a big kind of picture look at this set. To me, this is still a little stressful. 
Um, this set is nice, but it's, it's not great yet. I need something that's really easy and simple for me to follow on stage. So there's a couple final things I do, very minimal, small things. If you want to do them, great. If not, you don't have to. But one, I hide my return tracks. I don't need to see those once they're done. If I needed to adjust individual track volumes for songs, I could do that here. Right, so this song's maybe a little loud, so let's pull this up and say, let's bring this to minus four. That controls my volume for the entire song, but I still have individual outputs. It's the beauty of sins and returns. Um, so I do that. I'm gonna hide detail view down here. I don't need to see that. And then what I do, this to me, it's silly, it's small, but this is uh, the biggest piece that helps with kind of understanding what's happening on stage. So I'm gonna select all of song one here and let's pick a color. Um, actually, let's go over here. Let's start with this. Let's pick this color for song one. Uh, I'm going to right click and assign track color to group tracks and clips. Uh, and then I'm going to select all of this bit up here and we're going to do that as well too. Okay. Um, some people do this different ways. They leave the top stuff, uh, you know, a different color from the songs. But to me, this really, really helps, right? To see the song. So let's go to this one. Let's pick this yellow color, right click, assign track color to group tracks and clips. And then again, we'll highlight all this. And let's make this yellow as well too, all right? So now you can already start to see that's way easier to see where one song starts and the other song ends, okay? Uh, let's go to this one and let's say uh, this kind of cool Florida blue, all right? Assign track color to group tracks and clips. It's definitely not blue, that's like greenish. Oh, I picked different colors there. Let's do this one then. That's the one I meant. Yeah, there we go. Still waiting for that copy and paste color, Ableton. I need that, I need that in my life. Uh, this last one, let's make it um, this kind of purplish color, pinkish color. I apparently I'm colorblind, I can't see what colors are. Uh, and then again, I'll do this uh, for this last piece here. So let's select that and a lot of colors. There we go, so now to me, I mean, you do what you want to do. Maybe this stresses you out. Maybe you are colorblind. Maybe you just hate having color in your life and uh, you're a dull person. But to me, this is really easy to see. It's really easy to follow. I visually can see where song three starts and ends, where song four is. I see the separation from that. And this is just easy for me to look at. Plus, this is way easier to follow than if, for example, I did this. Let me show you how some of us, our Ableton sets look. Some of us think that if it looks difficult or feels difficult, then we're doing it the right way and we're dumb if we don't. If my set was open like this, I would, again, you do it however you wanna do it. I personally would feel super overwhelmed um, to be able to just have my set like this um, and have access to everything kind of closed up like this is, is way nicer, neater, cleaner to me. Um, so at this point, I have all the freedom and flexibility I need. Um, my MIDI controller is pre-mapped. I can do everything I need to with my MIDI controller. My audio routing is already routed. My songs are my Ableton set. Um, I would maybe focus a little more on transitions, for example. So I'd maybe zoom in here and say, okay, I actually want this to start doing during that ending. So I'm going to highlight this, Command Shift Delete, delete that, and then I'll pull this ending back out so that uh, song one is ending as the next song is starting. Uh, maybe I'll decide to add a little fade in there. So that's fading out while this one's starting. Um, there's a lot more I could do here to really customize this and dial this in. But at the heart of this, what I'm doing is building an Ableton Live set of multiple songs together. It took me, you know, I, I talked for a while and as I'm recording this, we're about 20 minutes. Um, uh, I can do this in five minutes, you know, very easily and do all that comfortably. Um, and again, I'll link in the description of this where you can see me actually build it in five minutes if you want to follow along. But um, this is how I would suggest building your Ableton Live sets. And again, this is a process you can follow that's efficient, that's stable, not gonna cause issues with your computer. Uh, and most of all, you get freedom and flexibility, which is really, really important. Again, to make all this happen, you don't have to try to do this on your own. You don't have to try to figure this out on your own. You don't have to leave a comment on a YouTube video and hope that someone replies. Um, you can head to from studiostage.com slash template, and you can download this exact template that I used uh, to follow along, to try this out on your own. And then when you do that, you're gonna get access to that six day course. Again, that's completely free. I wanna show you how to set up your template with your MIDI controller audio interface, how to format your songs with it, how to build an Ableton Live set with it, and then how to use it in rehearsal and live. You're gonna get access to all of that for free. Again, all you gotta do is head to from studio to stage.com slash template. And if you wanna go even further, like check out my basic tracks template, my advanced tracks template, and over 60 courses that we have on the site, then you can become a From Studio to Stage student. You can do that by heading to fromstudiotostage.com slash subscribe. And if you're not ready to do either of those, I'm not sure why you're here, but if you're not, that's fine. 
then you should consider subscribing to the YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button, enable the bell icon so you know exactly when I go live. And I hope to see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye.